Coming up, Jonathan and Todd join cave adventurer Ed Sorensen on a quest to find the elusive cave salamander. Welcome to Jonathan Bird's Blue World. As a scuba diver, I don't encounter many amphibians. But there's one amphibian I've been wanting to see ever since I got CAVE certified. The elusive cave salamander. Salamanders are lizard-like amphibians that live in moist environments. After being born from an egg, salamanders have an aquatic larval phase where they're known as tadpoles. During this phase, they have gills. Most salamanders then climb out of the water and breathe with lungs. But there are exceptions. The Georgia blind salamander is only known to exist in caves of the Florida aquifer, which stretches from Georgia into Florida. It lives its whole life underwater, never develops lungs, and in fact, never develops working eyes since it lives entirely in submerged caves. Our adventure begins at Merritt's Mill Pond in Mariana, Florida. If it looks like a flooded river, that's because this pond was created by damming up a river to power a mill. The mill is gone, but now it's a reservoir originating at Jackson Blue Spring and there are underwater cave entrances all around the pond. We start our day at our lakeside rental house where cameraman Todd, Zach and I are loading our dive boat. A pontoon boat with a big flat working space that we rented from Cave Adventurers, the local dive shop. So, on other dive trips, we need a car. But on this dive trip, we need a boat because all the dive sites are on this pond. And this will be our commuter vehicle. We call her the APB, the Ancient Pontoon Boat. And it's a, you know, pretty appropriate name. I mean, this is some some quality construction. There we go. Nice! APB! The APB is alive! Our first stop this morning is the dive shop to pick up Ed Sorensen, da, 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 da. a cave diving legend who not only owns the dive shop, but knows where to find the salamanders. We head north up the pond, searching for the dive shop. Even if we weren't diving, this would be an absolutely beautiful place to just spend time on the water. The cypress trees with Spanish moss hanging off of them, growing out of crystal clear water, make this a truly unique place. Fortunately, even though we're pretty new here and we don't really know our way around that well, the dive shop has good signage. Cave divers from all around the world have come here for the amazing diving in this little pond. And this unassuming dock is where it all begins. Up the hill, cave adventurers. I meet with Ed Sorensen and Mehdi Zinetti to discuss our plan so for the day. If it looks like it's good, we'll film what we can film. If it looks bad, then we'll hop on the boat and head down to JV. Right. Ed subtly reminds us that we ought to hit the gym because his training room and his gym are the same room. He shows us the map of one of the most popular dives on the pond, Twin Cave. It has more than 8,000 feet of surveyed passages. There's a deep spot in a place called First Pit where we'll search for the salamanders. 
We load Ed's dive gear onto the APB and we're off. Here we go. Ed is driving. Not only does he own the boat, but he knows the way. That leaves Zach free to fly the drone and get some fantastic shots. We head only a short distance and then we're there. Not sure if we would have found it on our own though. We pull up to a dock basically in the middle of nowhere. People who don't know all about the cave diving must find it odd that there's a dock here. It's the Twin Cave staging area. As soon as the boat is tied up, we start suiting up. Can't wait to hit the water. Ooh, boy, they are very slippery in the water, aren't they? Uh-huh. Quite slippery. The ladder steps are covered in slippery algae. We need to be careful. There's that algae. Once we're all suited up and ready to go, Ed gives us a few last-minute words of advice. He knows some good places in the cave to get nice shots, so we form a shooting plan in advance. And film with that rock around your lens. Film us going by. Cool. That would, I think that would be a good shot. Cool. Finally, the moment of truth. We swim through the eelgrass over to the entrance of the cave. Ed is using his KISS rebreather, which recycles every breath and therefore makes no bubbles. He can stay in this cave much longer than we can with our more low-tech open circuit scuba gear. So it will be our gas consumption that dictates how far we can get. As we drop into the cave entrance, I can't feel any significant water flow, which makes the diving easier, but it also means there's nothing to pull sediment out. So we need to be very careful about not kicking up any sediment. cavern zone we find limestone that has been eaten away and dissolved by water for thousands of years. The softer parts of the stone are gone, while the harder parts remain, creating rocks that look like Swiss cheese. Ed passes over the stop sign. Beyond this point, we can no longer see daylight from the entrance. We're passing from the cavern to the cave. We drop down into the main tunnel. To make it to the first pit, where we hope to find a blind cave salamander, we have about an 1100 foot swim. And this tunnel runs pretty level around 50 or so feet deep. The 
managing our breathing rates and gas consumption are important. In this long run of cave, we're basically just in a tube. There are no side passages for a while. Just two ways to go, in or out. And we're following Ed in. There's a heavy-duty, permanent gold line in this main section. Under no circumstances do we ever allow this line out of our sight. It is our guideline to the surface. Ed stops to point out something. At first, I'm not sure what he's shining his light on, but as I gently move in closer, I can see their animal bones. An animal that walked in here during the last ice age, when the water table was lower and this cave was at least partially unsubmerged. We don't have much time to waste, so we keep moving. Ed keeps his pace leisurely. Trying to move quickly underwater wastes air on open circuit. To keep our air consumption under control, we have to relax and go slow. Todd and I tend to play leapfrog, where we alternate getting shots of each other, so we alternate who is ahead of the other. Even though the water is not super clear today, the small confined nature of the tunnels doesn't really require a lot of visibility. We drop into a small depression and there's a side passage called Skiles Passage. It's very small and looks like something fun for another day. But we keep moving. I allow Todd and Ed to pass by and get a good shot. Then I'm taking up the back for a while. I love the look of the lights ahead of me in the cave. I'm fascinated by the patterns of erosion on the walls. Why did it form like this? Thousands of years of rushing water has strange effects on soft stone like limestone. And I'm keeping an eye peeled in all the holes for a salamander. Out of nowhere, a catfish appears. This is not some kind of special cave-adapted catfish. This is a regular catfish like you would see out in the pond. What is it doing in here? I have no idea, but it doesn't seem lost like it wants to follow our lights. Ed just keeps chugging along nice and slow for us bubble blowers. He keeps an eye on us, but the rebreather is so quiet that he can tell where we are just by the noise we make with our breathing. Finally, after about 35 minutes of swimming, we reach a crack in the floor of the cave. We have arrived at the first pit. Apparently there's a second pit, but that's for another day. We're going to drop almost vertically into the pit. We follow Ed and the guideline straight down to about a hundred feet deep.
This is a permanent T on the guideline. One part of the cave goes down, and the other part keeps going straight. With no bubbles coming out of Ed's rebreather, there's no reference for which way's up. But he's going straight down this chimney. We're a third of a kilometer from the entrance and getting deeper by the second. Finally, we encounter the sandy bottom of the pit. Ed checks to make sure we're all good, and then we continue. Now we're searching carefully for a salamander. Down here, the tunnel is low and silty. And then, Ed's eagle eyes spot movement. At first, I think he's pointing to a blind cave fish. Then I look more carefully, and I realize we found the salamander! It can swim like a fish with its tail, but when it lands on the bottom, it walks on its legs. If you look carefully, you can see the very fine filaments of its gills just behind its head. Very little is known about this tiny amphibian. It has lost its pigment because it lives where there's no natural light. It can't see, but it can definitely tell I'm here from movement in the water. And if it's anything like the blind cave fish, it may be able to sense the presence of light, even if it can't actually see. We had good timing because after we've filmed the salamander, Todd and I are both pretty close to thirds. That means we've used one-third of our air, so we need to turn around. That gives us the remaining two-thirds of our air to get back, which should be twice as much as we need, so we have extra in case of a delay or a malfunction to deal with. We make our way back up the fissure known as the first pit. Ed has to ascend a little slower than we do to manage the expanding gas in his rebreather. Soon we're back up to 60 feet and we're working our way back out of the cave.
We're following the arrows, which always point the way out. And this one says 500 on it, which means we're 500 feet from the entrance. We see another catfish, and I'm working up a hypothesis that since they normally live in very murky water and use their whiskers to find prey, maybe they don't need light. But what could they be eating in here? Maybe the reason there aren't many salamanders is that they're catfish food. That is food for thought as we continue our long swim. Eventually, we make it back and we ascend up into the cavern zone with the stop sign. We have a few minutes of decompression before we can head to the surface. So we fill our time getting some shots of the rock formations. Finally, with our decompression obligation complete, we swim out of the cave and into the sunlight of the pond. We swim through the eelgrass and back to the dock. We made it! Well, that was truly unimpressive viz. Well, it got better as we went in. Yeah, if we'd have got to that jump, it would have cleared right up, but... It's hard to believe that there's a salamander that lives its whole life underwater like a fish. But then to find out that there's a very specific kind of salamander that lives its whole life underwater in a cave with no light just blows my mind. The diversity and complexity of life fascinates me. And it's one of the things that keeps me coming back over and over to explore the incredible blue world. Hey, you guys, check out that video. It's a really good one. Also, this one's pretty good, too. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe.